Pennsylvania. So today I'll be talking to you about the ilioinguinal nerve, iliohypogastric nerve, transversus dominus plane, and talk to you also a little bit about the genital femoral nerve. These are my disclosures. They will have no bearing on the talk today. So what I'm going to do is go over the anatomy, and I think the reason that we should consider ultrasound for these blocks is that the anatomy is very variable, and it's often much different than sometimes the textbooks present. Uh, we know that innervation patterns are also different in individuals. I'm going to talk to you about the traditional landmark-based techniques, and they do have some limitations, and I think that's another reason to consider the use of ultrasound. Talk to you about the ultrasound-guided techniques. And then I think the real issue with these blocks as we advance is that many of these techniques have now been validated, but do they improve the chronic pain state? And I think that's what Dr. Gofeld was talking about to some extent. When we do an ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric nerve block, do we change the chronic pain state? And there's just been some studies published on that. So traditionally, we used to do these techniques with palpation guidance, nerve stimulation. Now we're considering ultrasound from an interventional and diagnostic standpoint. So the first blocks I'm going to talk about are the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric nerve. And if you look at the anatomy, and you look at the anatomy published in some textbooks, the normal pattern of sensory distribution is probably only accurate about 20% of the time when you look at live patients. And if you look at patients the right and the left-hand side, they're not symmetrical. Only about 40% of patients are symmetrical with regards to their innervation patterns. The ilioinguinal nerve comes off L1, iliohypogastric nerve, T12, and L1. And remember that the iliohypogastric nerve has two branches, the anterior and lateral branch. The lateral branch goes to the lateral aspect of the hip. The anterior branch provides innervation above the inguinal ligament. You have three muscles that we really care about when we're doing this under ultrasound guidance. That is the external oblique. And it's important if you go too far medial or too far caudad, you may only see an aponeurosis. Internal oblique, transverse abdominis, and then I think there's one artery that you should really be concerned about when you do this block, and that's the deep circumflex iliac artery, which comes off the external iliac artery. Here you can see the branches, the lateral cutaneous branch coming off the iliohypogastric nerve, and also the anterior cutaneous branch. So when you look at traditional landmark-based techniques, there's clearly been failure rates, as high as 45% in some cases. Uh, and if you look at some of the case reports, I think it gives you another reason to contemplate uh, utilizing ultrasound for these blocks. There's been two cases of six-year-olds. One was a small bowel subserosal hematoma, which you can see on the right-hand side here. And the other one was a 14-year-old that had a colonic puncture. And then there was a 40-year-old that had a pelvic hematoma. And the reason that they thought that probably occurred was is that here's lateral, here's medial, here's the external oblique, Here's the internal oblique. Here's the transverse abdominis. Here's the iliacus. Probably he, uh, hit the deep circumflex iliac artery. In pediatric population, it's probably more important also to consider ultrasound because it may be difficult to see all the muscle layers. Sometimes you can only identify two muscle layers, and the nerve to peritoneum distance is very small. It's on the average of about three millimeters. So when you look at the landmark-based technique that we've traditionally done, um, they, so what they did here is they took 21 subjects, and they did a landmark-based technique. Mean age was 72. And then they placed their ultrasound probe on afterwards to identify where the needle was and where the local anesthetic was. And what they found was when they did this, this is often the way you've been taught, you went medial to the AIS, you did a fascial click, you found, uh, hoping to identify by palpation as you pop through the interaction between the external oblique and internal oblique, uh, internal oblique and transverse abdominis, and then they checked their needle position with ultrasound. What they found was in only 57% of patients uh, was the needle positioned between the internal oblique and transverse abdominis, and that's where we think the nerves are in many uh, cases, especially when you are cephalad and slightly caudad to the ASIS. And 43% were found deep to the transverse abdominis muscle. So why do we care about that? Well, if you look at this picture here, you have the ASIS, you have medial, you have lateral, external oblique, internal oblique, the fascial layer where the nerves are found, and you have the iliacus. So if we go far lateral, probably not going to cause much harm because we just go right into the iliacus muscle. But if we go medial, we could pop into the peritoneum. So when you do this technique, the, this has been a validated technique. Um, you find the ASIS. You go slightly cephalad, a little bit posterior. You 
have your probe in line with the umbilicus and the ASIS, you would identify three muscle layers, the external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis. We know based on anatomical studies that in 90% of individuals, the nerves will be found between the transverse abdominis and internal oblique. And again, be careful to identify the uh, deep circumflex iliac artery. So here you have lateral, you have the external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, and you can see your nerves right here. So this technique has been validated. There was 10 embalmed cadavers, 37 blocks. They used 0.1 milliliter of dye. Um, there was a 95% success rate with regards to technical accuracy. And I think that's important. There's, you know, validation is extremely important to identify technical accuracy. And then as I talk to you later, I think the next thing is, are we having clinical efficacy? Uh, this, the BMI was about 20. The location and size, needle... Um, Nerve to bone distance for the ilioinguinal was about six millimeters. The depth of the nerves was 1.2 centimeters, and the median diameter of the nerves were small. So again, here you can see lateral, medial, external oblique, internal oblique, transverse dominus. You can see the nerves right here. It's very important that you use a Doppler function because sometimes you can mistake the uh, deep circumflex iliac artery for uh, the, the nerves. And so if you look here, you can see Without Doppler, you have external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, iliacus, peritoneum, lateral, and you see the structure right here, which you possibly could consider nerves. Once you put on the Doppler function, now you see that that is the deep circumflex iliac artery. The genital femoral nerve, I think this is a nerve that we clearly need to work on more, because if you look at the surgical literature, this nerve is probably involved in a substantial cases of persistent pain after hernia repair. We don't have a truly validated technique for this. There's been proposed techniques um, in review articles. And remember, the genital femoral nerve comes off L1 and L2. It pierces the psoas muscle at about the L3 level. Uh, there's two branches. There's a femoral branch, which provides sensation below the inguinal ligament uh, in the thigh region. And then there's a genital branch, which is a motor and sensory nerve. In a female, it follows the round ligament. Uh, you have the labia majora, which provides innervation to in the mons pubis. In men, it follows the spermatic cord, and you have also innervation to the cremastic muscles. And scrotum. So the difficulty with the genital branch, which again probably is a reason for persistent pain following hernia surgery, is that the genital branch, its relation to the spermatic cord is quite variable. We know that it can be ventral, dorsal, and inferior. It can actually be part of the cremaster muscle. And if you look at anatomical studies in 116 dissections in the genital femoral nerve and the inguinal canal, only 3% were outside of the spermatic cord. So most of them were inside some degree of the spermatic cord. And if you look in 13% of cases, there was actually um, connections between the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve and the ilioinguinal nerve. And there's been three major pathways described. But if you look at the anatomy picture here from a common uh, anatomical textbook, you can see they actually show the genital nerve, uh, the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve within the cremaster muscle. Again, here you have the panfuniform flexus. You have the artery of the vas deferens. You have the vas deferens right there. And you also have the testicular artery. So when you're doing this under ultrasound, you can look for these arteries to help you identify the spermatic cord. So the traditional technique that we do is that we find the pubic tubercle, we find the inguinal ligament, we go a point lateral to the pubic tubercle, uh, below the inguinal ligament, and we do a field block with large volumes of local anesthetic. Their concerns are, is one is that we could be in the peritoneal cavity, we could injure abdominal viscera, uh, we could hit the femoral artery, and we could also injure structures within the spermatic cord, such as the testicular artery and also vas deferens. So here you would see the pubic tubercles and the pubic symphysis right there. So there's been limited publications on this. We clearly need more validated techniques. There's been one study published in Pain Physician. It was not specifically for the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. It was actually for the femoral branch. Um, and there has been techniques described in review articles of how to block the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve using the surrogate marker of the spermatic cord.
So one technique that's been described within review articles is that you'd use a high-frequency linear array probe. It would be the nerve is difficult to visualize in the inguinal canal, but you'd look for, again, surrogate markers, such as the spermatic cord or the round ligament. So the first thing you would do is you would find the femoral artery, which we're very used to from regional anesthesia when we do femoral nerve blocks. You would rotate your probe to the long axis. You would trace the femoral artery till it becomes the external iliac artery. And just slightly medial, you will see the spermatic cord as it crosses over. You are going to do an out-of-plane technique, deep to the abdominal fascia, both in and outside of the spermatic cord, again, because of those anatomical studies showing that this nerve has quite a degree of variability. Sometimes it can be inside, other times it can be outside. The other technique that you could find the, uh, the spermatic cord is that you could scan above the inguinal ligament. You could locate the rectus muscle medially, which is right here. You could find the inferior epigastric artery, and you know that that dives down into the external iliac artery if you chase it, uh, trace it back um, laterally and caught at. Once you find that structure, then you can find the, uh, you found the external iliac artery, and you would just scan slightly medially, and you'll see the spermatic cord crossing over. And then you can scan down to the pubic tubercle and look for the spermatic cord just lateral. So here, if you look, you can see the external iliac artery. This is the, the long axis where you've traced it from the femoral artery. And you can see the spermatic cord right above. And you can see part of the pampiniform plexus. Now this would be the uh, transverse axis. And what you can see here is the external iliac artery, external iliac vein. And you see a structure right here, which is a spermatic cord. If you trace that down you can see that right next to the pubic tubercle. And so you would inject in and outside the spermatic cord. So if you watch these videos, this is the, the two techniques that one could consider. So just to, this would be the femoral artery, femoral nerve. And you're scanning back, going to the long axis. Actually seeing the inferior epigastric seeing the spermatic cord right there. This is when you would scan from the rectus muscle. You would scan caudad, lateral, find the uh, inferior epigastric going into the external iliac artery, and then you would find the spermatic cord. Watch the vessel there coming into the external iliac. See the spermatic cord crossing over. And then you can see the uh, pubic tubercle coming over in this window. The next block I'm going to talk about is a transverse abdominis plane block. Uh, that, you know, there's many techniques that you can do that with landmark based. You can do the triangle of petite and the double pop technique. Um, the needle is inserted perpendicular. If you do it through the triangle of petite, latissimi dorsi, external oblique, iliac crest. You can also do it when you pop through the external oblique fascia, external, and then you look for the internal oblique and transverse abdominis plane via palpation. Now there's an ultrasound guided technique where you can go to high frequency linear array probe, go to the lateral decubitus position, mid-axillary line, you go between the iliac crest and the costal margin, and you are going to avoid being too far medial. This would be an example of being too far medial because you just see the rectus muscle. And you're going to use a blunt 21-gauge 4-inch needle. I think it's important that we consider doing this block under ultrasound guidance because this was a study just recently published in 2012 looking at the traditional technique with uh, palpation guidance and feeling for the two pops. And what they did was an anterior approach. They wanted to have 60 patients. They terminated it early because in 36 patients, uh, they found that in most cases, the needle was not where they desired. So they would do this block with the traditional technique, then scan with ultrasound and see where the needle was. What you can see is that only 23% was the needle in the transverse abdominis plane where you want to block. 36% were the internal oblique. And then the concerning thing is the reason that the study was discontinued early is that 18% were actually in the peritoneum. The needle was in the peritoneum.
So what was happening, and if you look here, you have external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, and this is where you would target, they were actually going deep into the peritoneal cavity. I think the reality is, is that we can target these nerves well now, especially for the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric nerve. This study was just published in 2012, and I think we've all felt this clinically. Are we changing the chronic pain state? And also, if we're considering such things as peripheral nerve stimulation, how accurate are these blocks at diagnosing the problem? So what they did is they had um, 12 patients who had severe post herniopathy pain. They had 12 controls, and they did a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial. And you have to understand, there's, even though we do the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve blocks all the time, there's really been no control studies published. They looked for analgesic and sensory effects. They actually used the contralateral side as control in some individuals. They had to prematurely discontinue this study because in the 12 patients, 11 patients were non-responders to the local anesthetic with only one responder. And they found no significant pain reduction and no consistent changes in neurophysiological assessments. So if you look at the sum of pain intensity differences between lidocaine and placebo, you can see there was really no difference in the 12 patients that had the diagnosis. And they did the block, as we traditionally teach it with ultrasound, above the ASIS, slightly cephalad, and slightly caudad, using the line from the umbilicus to the ASIS, blocking the nerves between the transverse abdominis and internal oblique. So what they concluded was is that ultrasound-guided ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric nerve blocks for persistent inguinal post herniopathy pain. This was a randomized double-blind crossover study. They did not find them to be useful. Ultrasound-guided blocks of the inguinal and iliohypogastric nerves at the level of the ASIS are not useful in the diagnosis and management of persistent inguinal post herniopathy pain. And they did validate their technique. They were sure that they were blocking these nerves. So why is that? Well, I think as we look in the future, the sensory innervation after hernia repair, we have branches of the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, genital femoral nerve. There may be a more prominent role of the genital femoral nerve. We need to validate a technique for that. The nerves uh, branching, uh, maybe we're having nerve branches higher than we thought before. Remember, there's two branches to iliohypogastric. There's an anterior and lateral branch. And really, could this just be a central sensitization and a central pain processing pathway that we're not going to change with a single block? They also uh, pointed out in the study that there was a significant placebo response in five of the 12 pain patients, and that we should use controlled blocks if we are considering use this as a diagnostic block. So in conclusion, it's important when we do these blocks that we understand anatomy, both sonoanatomy and relational anatomy. Um, limitations of landmark-based techniques, clearly there, as I pointed out in the studies. Uh, ultrasound has been shown to help with accuracy and avoidance of structures that you don't want to target. And when we look at treatment, I think we have to now take the next step and say, are these blocks changing pain paths? Thank you very much. <laughs>